Okay, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Um, sorry, we're starting a little bit late. So this session is on creative audio and video. If that's not what you're expecting, you have to stay. <laughs> you can't leave. <laughs> I'm Angela Saini. I'm a science journalist, and I've been a science journalist for about six years. But before that, I was a video journalist for BBC News, not working in science. And before that, I was an ITN trainee, also not working in science news. Um, and I was one of their first people to be trained up in multimedia. So, like many of, many of you, I think, um, I listen to NPR Radio Lab and I watch these amazing science films coming out of America mainly. And I really wanted to see that kind of output in the UK. And I know people are doing it, I just don't know where they are and uh, who they are. So that's why I have this panel with me who are going to enlighten me and hopefully enlighten you. And I hope also that you will all chip in with your thoughts. Um, if you've heard something amazing or seen something amazing, then please let us know and share it so that um, by that process all our output can improve. Um, so we have three panellists today. Um, they are each going to talk for about 10 minutes um, on the topic of creative audio and video. And then we're going to go to questions, but it's going to be a more of a chat. So we're, we're all going to discuss with each other, I hope. Um, the panelists we have um, on my right is Mohit Bakaya. He is a commissioning editor at BBC Radio 4, and he's behind a lot of the new science programming that you've heard um, in recent years, including the Infinite Monkey Cage, am yep. I right? Yeah, Infinite Monkey Cage, which is really cutting edge with Robin Inns and Brian Cox, and the new replacement to Material World, Inside Science, which is presented by Adam Rutherford, and he's also involved in commissioning one-off shows and documentaries. So this is your chance to find out what actually goes on behind the scenes at Radio 4 when those programmes get made that you either love or you hate. Sue Nelson, at the end here, uh, is an award-winning science writer and broadcaster whom many of you may know um, from her time as <coughs> one of the BBC's science correspondents. Um, she now presents radio programs on uh, Radio 4, and her series, Citizen Science, actually got a call from Buckingham Palace because both the Queen and Prince Philip loved it so much. I don't know whether that's an endorsement or not. <laughs> <laughs> but they invited <laughs> scientists who were in it to Buckingham Palace, but not me. Oh, <laughs> that's a shame. She's dead to me. That's not fair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who cares? We're all Republicans anyway. Um, today she runs Boffin Media with your husband, I think, That's right, yeah. uh, who's also a very illustrious journalist. Um, and they make many things, um, among which is the Space Boffins podcast. Uh, Brady Harron, on my left, um, started his career as a newspaper journalist in Australia before moving to the UK and working for the BBC both online and in television. In recent years, he started working full-time making online videos and runs some of YouTube's most popular educational channels, um, covering things like mathematics, chemistry, physics, and astronomy. The films are approaching 200 million views, which is incredible, and over 2 million subscribers, which is even more impressive. And today is Brady's birthday. Hey. Yay! Thank you. Thank you very much. 18 today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, so... Brady's going to go first. His presentation is already up, and he'll be talking about video. Yes. Brady, off to you. I'll try and be quite quick because I was just going to, basically, I was going to introduce myself and what has brought me here and what I've done, and then hopefully some questions may arise from it, perhaps in the question part. You heard, you heard. I used to work in newspapers in Australia, and then I worked for the BBC each for about seven years. Like Angela, I was a general news reporter, journalist, but I had a real passion for science and a science bent, so quite often I was doing science reports. And then basically, to cut a long story very short, I started a project called Test Tube with the University of Nottingham, which was all about showing what science is really like and what scientists really do, rather than... Um, sort of the press release or just big announcement type stuff. It was, it was trying to show you day-to-day -day life, sometimes the drudgery and dreariness of being a scientist and the long days in the lab and the refused grant applications. And other times it was about spectacular fun things. And that project was very successful and it continues today and it, it won various awards. Awards and things went really well. So as a result of that, I started another channel, sort of a spin-off spin channel as a result of some chemists I'd met. 
and this was called Periodic Table of Videos. And the starting premise was to do a video about every element on the periodic table, and you click on each element on the website, and up pops a YouTube video about that element. And it became very successful, uh, much more than we ever expected, to the point where when we had done all 118 elements, we couldn't stop. So now it's become sort of a general chemistry channel. We travel around the world making videos and chemistry news or just interesting things we want to show people and blowing things up. And uh, Although we do travel around the world, the most interesting place I think we've been was here in London. It was the Bank of England gold bullion vault with sort of £180 billion worth of gold in it, which was pretty amazing to get to go in there and film that. This again was a collaboration at the University of Nottingham and the physics department was getting jealous so they wanted to do a project as well so we started one which was called 60 Symbols. The idea was to make 60 videos at the start and because there's no periodic table in physics we kind of just made one up and we made physics videos attached to various symbols. Again we got to the end having done 60 and it too had become much more popular than we imagined and we couldn't stop so now we've done something like 200 videos but it's still called 60 Symbols. And again, we've travelled all around the world to telescopes and the Large Hadron Collider and made all sorts of videos, and it's, it's really good fun. Um, I have to keep looking at the screen because my computer's not matching what's on the screen. Uh, an ast astronomy channel started later, deep sky videos. Again, you can probably imagine what that's about, lots of astronomy stuff. I won't bore you with all the details, but really good fun and new videos all the time. And this is all this stuff all filmed at, in Chile and things like that, so all about objects in space. And then uh, the channel I've done, which has probably become most successful, is called Numberphile, which is uh, a mathematics... Well, it's mainly mathematics. It's actually... I gave myself a bit of an out by calling it Numberphile, so it could be anything to do with numbers. So sometimes it could be something cultural or something different to do with numbers. But most of the time it's pretty mathematical. This has become very popular and is now being uh, sponsored by the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute which is in Berkeley, so a lot of the time is spent filming with mathematicians in Berkeley now. They're really excited about it and how many people watch and how enthused people are becoming about mathematics as a result of these videos. Uh, a spin-out channel called, from number file, I started called Computer File. You can probably guess what that's about. Everything I've shown you until now, I've pretty much, I do on my own. Uh, this was the first time I sort of said, actually, I think I'm going to need a bit of help here because there are videos going on these channels every week. And this is, 90% of the work on this is done by a very talented uh, colleague who helps me out called Sean Riley. But again, all about computer science. And it's probably the newest channel, but again, very, already very popular and, and lots of good fun to do. Um, a lot more technical than the other channels, but computer people just love that. And I've done a lot of other projects. Some of them are sciencey as well, and some of them are not sciencey, but there's sort of psychology and philosophy and... One with the uh, STFC where we went behind the scenes and all their big machines around the country and things like that. So you can go. And I did one about every book in the Bible as well, just to show that I'm open minded about such things, which was really good fun. That was just one I wanted to do because I thought it would be fascinating. Um, so there are some statistics on, on the videos. I don't know how much you all know about YouTube, but subscribers are very important. They're sort of the currency of the, of their, their sort of your regular signed on viewers. So Across all the channels, about 2.7 million people have subscribed, which is sort of your core fan base that hopefully come in and watch lots of the videos. And there's some of the viewing figures on the videos. And as Angela said, nearly 200 million people have watched the video now on YouTube. And that obviously doesn't include other things that happen with them, like in schools and things like that. But, um, so that's kind of me and what I do and what brought me here. Uh, I have got a video here just to prove like I'm not making it up and I actually do make some videos. So uh, I don't know if it will play or not. I think we're about to find out from my history using PowerPoint. I have serious doubts, but let's give it a go. Oh, why does that keep going away? Yeah, that's not going to happen. It's playing on my screen. Yeah. Um, I thought the video was going to get put in here, but it hasn't been. Let me try. I'll give it a couple more seconds before I just give up hope altogether. It's a really cool video. I could tell you what's happening, just like <laughs> talk, talk you through it. How long is it, baby? Two minutes. The <laughs> no, I think that probably probably wouldn't Leave quite it. do it justice. No offence to the radio people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess we'll leave it. Okay, 
what we'll do is we'll get some AV person to come up and maybe we can play it by the end. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Does it make you want to watch it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you've, we'll all, you've all got iPads or laptops. We'll go see how we... website and <laughs> We'll see how we go. Maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll sort something out later. Oh, oh, well, no, that's not it. But what I did was I shut PowerPoint. I don't think I've ever done a presentation anywhere where this hasn't happened, so t today's no exception. Okay, let's I'll stop and we'll try it later, maybe. Yeah, let's try later. Thank you for listening, and <laughs> trust me, the videos are all right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Really good. I'll answer any questions anyone, anyone has. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, Sue is next. Hi. While she gets ready, Brady, I think um, me in particular, but I'm sure other people, would like to know what equipment do you use to make your vi videos? I use all sorts of equipment and it has changed over time. At the moment, I mainly make my videos with a Canon C100 camera. I, I edit on Avid. Um, I also have a, a really high speed camera to do some snazzy slow motion things, which is uh, really expensive. I wasn't able to buy that myself, but we were able to do that with the university. Uh, is that the sort of thing you're wanting to know? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I put radio mics on everyone I interview because I think sound, yeah. sound is, funnily enough, sound is the most important thing on video, online video. It's too late saying that now. No, <laughs> no, no, no. In fact, when people ask me to give technical advice, the, the, the number one thing I always say is all that matters is sound because people will tolerate crappy pictures on their iPhone or wherever they're watching it. They'll, they'll, they'll stick with something if it's interesting enough, if they can't see it properly. But, properly. but they will not tolerate bad sound. And even if people haven't got like really cool equipment, I always say, for goodness sake, just stop for 10 seconds and think about sound. Is there a lawnmower in the background? Or are you next to a big road that you don't have to be next to? Is there like a machine in the corner that's making a racket? Because people don't think of that when they first start out. And nothing kills an, a video quicker than bad sound, funnily enough. Sue, are we ready? Yeah, okay. yeah, I think Perfect. so. I heard it. I heard it start to play. <laughs> so fingers crossed. I don't know how loud it'll be, but um, we'll see, see how we go. Um, yeah, let me just check the time so I know when to stop. Um, my name's Sue Nelson, and um, I work for Radio 4, 5 Live, World Service, as an executive producer, a producer, a reporter, occasionally a presenter, a contributor, and <coughs> in the same role... Um, for podcasts. So as you can tell, I've been doing this a very, very long time. Um, but my career actually began on the other side of the studio glass. I joined the BBC as a studio manager, which is effectively a, a sort of sound engineer, really. But it was a most fantastic start to get into producing, which is what I then did next after that, and then reporting and presenting, because it gives you a real feel for what the medium is because our training um, it actually included things like listening to bits of sound and deciding whether they were in phase or out of phase, whether they needed more treble or, or not, and then what you could hear and what an edit worked and, and how it worked. And all those skills I learnt there have been absolutely fantastic for, for the rest of my sort of work within radio. And what I especially loved about it when I was a studio manager, I, I actually, I was lucky enough, it's a little bit mouldy, so I have to excuse me, it shows you what's in my fridge. This is one of the first things I did um, as a studio manager within months of training, and it just made me realise how much I love it. I actually have, um, I'm lucky I didn't stop, I had, to, I had to bring this in my bag in the tube, so I was a little bit worried about how I was going to do it. But I had to do the effects for dramas, and um, the drama in question was a, um, a load of people, actors in togas, but obviously they weren't in togas, but it was a toga drama. And at one point they all ended up, A, having a sword fight, and I was handed a sword with the other studio manager and actually had, because they are reading the script and holding the thing, and I had to use the swords to make the sound, and also had to go in turn with the movements and grunts, because it's no use them going, take that, or, you know, uh, and then you go, ding. You have to do it with the right, and also uh, we got told of a director, sound like a man. So we actually <laughs> had to go like, ding, ah, you know, and they would do it too and really do it heavily. And then came the stabbing in the back scene, and then I was given this. I had to sit on the floor, cross-legged, with a cabbage between my knees, <laughs> no health and safety, given a knife, <laughs> and I had to do, when the actor went to stab, 
Because that's what's the effect of... It's pr exactly. <laughs> By the end of three takes, there was coleslaw all <laughs> over the place. But it really, you know, it was just such a fantastically enjoyable day that you think this is utterly ridiculous and yet utterly fantastic. Because within sound, often the sounds don't necessarily sound what you think they're going to sound like. So you can occasionally record something that you think, this is fantastic, but when you take away the visuals and you just play it on its own, it bears no resemblance to what you know it is because you've seen it and other people ha hasn't. So you really have to take the sounds that you're recording and using um, into, into account. And um, I was really fortunate because at the time when the BBC used to spend a lot of money on training, I also got trained as a producer with the BBC, alongside Harry Thompson, the late Harry Thompson, I don't know if you remember him, as the comedy um, um, producer, and, and lots of other people. And, and it was really great to be involved in the aspect of a room full of people to learn how you do things and why you, you know, do it the way you do. And I thought I'd just spell out before we do the Q&A some of the things that are reasons that I like radio, and I think radio really, really um, does it for me, even though I've spent eight years doing TV news and stuff, you know, when it, and I still make films, TV films and stuff. Um, radio definitely does it for me. One is the immediacy. Now, compared to television, if something happens, it's very rarely you get it right first time on film. And I'll give you an example of, uh, of this, of how it can work in radio. Um, we uh, produce the Planet Earth podcast for... Um, uh, Natural Environment Research Council. And one of the great things about that is the creative freedom they've given us. Every single podcast has to be recorded on location. So you have to think about how you're going to do it, the sounds you're going to have, the effects in the background, the movements. And so this will mean, as can often happen, sometimes people mistakenly think, you turn up at a museum, say, and they say, I brought out all the fossils for you. And you go, that's great. Could you put them all back now, please? Because you actually want to sometimes... You know, if it's an amazing... You're in the underground vault of the Natural History Museum, you've got these wonderful wooden vaults, and you want to hear the sliding doors come open, the chains. I mean, I did um, moon rock recently for a Radio 4 programme. The moon rock was kept in a safe that looked up sounds like a Wild West bank. And you could hear the chains and the clinking and the key, and you want all those sounds. And this was at um, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in their venom unit where they keep a whole load of snakes and extract their venom. And um, I hadn't expected what happened next. And at Lido, which is basically the guy says, I'll get one out for you. And he, he got out um, a puff adder and it has a very distinctive sound. And this is just that section here. And I hope... You will hear it. Good luck with that. Yeah. You're just going to open the cage. The snake just bit the microphone. <laughs> but you can see how very, very Oh, that sounds like somebody heavy breathing, doesn't it? Other people have said it sounds elementally evil. You think of dark. 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 <laughs> oh, well, it certainly gave me a terrible shock. Uh, it's, I don't know how. I'm sorry about. That was just the sound. Cabbage, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> Can't do the sound up. on that. But if we'd have been that, doing that for television, that would not have worked as well, because we had the mic, and that's it. Because you can't get a puff adder, extremely dangerous snake, to let's spit that venom on the microphone again. Yet that's what TV will often try and do. <laughs> They'll say, oh, 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 could you cry again? Could we have that emotion again? We need a wide shot and a mid shot and a, a long shot. And radio, if you've got your microphone running, can really get that immediacy. It also gets you access. Recently we made um, a documentary for the um, feature slot at 11 a.m. I think it was, or maybe it was from there. I can't remember. It was the, um, on Rockets in the Desert. I think it was the 11 o'clock slot. And it was 
done at the Edwards Air Force Base and the Mojave Desert in California, where you've got all these commercial space companies working, they will not. They're very, very cagey about TV. And several of the companies that we recorded, like Virgin Galactic, who stopped allowing TV in, and x will not allow anyone into film. They would allow us, because it was radio. And we got a fantastic sounds and effects of all the rockets being tested, um, the, the, the general sort of noise that was going on in that hangar, and it gave a brilliant picture just by listening to those sounds behind you of what was going on that actually in that case we got purely because we wear radio. I would say also radio for me works creatively because you get more in it. Your intellectual content is usually much greater. One of the first jobs I was given... Uh, when I joined the TV news department was they gave me a Horizon documentary and asked me to make a one minute and 30 second news piece out of an hour documentary. And my heart sank because I thought, oh my God, this is going to take ages, editing down an hour for a news piece. So I watched it and made, logged it and was making notes of all the bits in it that were new. I didn't have enough to fill a one minute 30 <laughs> news piece. Radio is very, very different to that. Um, sometimes it's just the voice, and I really wish I knew how to raise the volume on this. I'll say, I, I didn't know a Mac. But this woman's voice is fantastic. Her name is Jerry Truehill. She trained to be an astronaut in secret in the 1960s. This is a documentary from way back from 1997 I made, but it's still on um, Radio 4's website as one of their archive programme called Right Stuff, Wrong Sex. And... Um, this is Jerry. When I took my first airplane ride at three years old, my daddy took me with him down to Austin to the statewide oil hearing, which he went to every month. We flew down on an old brand of Flock Eagle X. Of course, it was new then. And um, the pilots invited me up in the cockpit. And uh, things were a little more informal then. And, and I sat up there with them, and they made me think I was flying the airplane I thought I was. And, and just really just knew right then that's what I was going to do. And when we got to Austin, the stewardess took me back to Dad, and um, Dad strapped me in, and he told me, he said, now, if you can grow up and be a registered nurse, which you had to be to be a stewardess then, then maybe you can be a stewardess, Julie, for an airline. I know Mr. Brannock is a friend of mine. I can get you a job as a stewardess. And I said, I don't want to be a stewardess. I don't want to do what she does. I'm going to be a pilot. Mr. Brannock can give me a job as a pilot. And I thought Daddy was going to faint. I mean, you know, he just said, women don't fly airplanes. And I said, I'm going to. I mean, you know, just a voice like that. And um, she was just one of the stars of that program, really. And she was one of the, they now call them the uh, Mercury 7, um, the women. They were all test, they were all pilots. Some of them were test pilots. Um, quite a few of them, including Jerry, I think, had more flying experience than John Glenn. Um, and, uh, and they passed all the medicals to get through, but uh, for various reasons did not get uh, <laughs> become one step for womankind, not least because somebody at NASA said they'd rather send monkeys into space than women. But... Uh, that's my little sex on the hat on. Um, finally, I think the, you know, the creativity. This is what we're here about. Interestingly, I think some of my cre most creative experiences within radio have been when I've been working in the radio science unit, um, along with Mo, and um, uh, one producer in particular, Alan, uh, Anne McNaught, who I'm delighted to see is actually um, shortlisted for one of the ABSW awards tonight. Because I'll give you... A some of the examples of the programs I made and the treatments that she did and we, we, we did together were just fantastic. One was called um, True Love at Last Scientific Proof, and that did actually win an ABSW award, I think it was that one, um, which was done all about the science of sexual attraction and attraction and was done in the science uh, style of a Mills and Boone novel. So we actually we made it similar to a drama or... A, you know, in, in, that sort of, in that sort of way. And um, it was such a joy to actually do. Another was The Detective, which we made in um, the style of a film noir. So it was like a sort of mock Humphrey Bogart-style movie. And again, bear in mind, this is the 90s. So it was, it was you know, quite, quite ahead of its time to do things in thinking in those styles. So I say, Anne is, is just amazing. And the other one we did was Born to be Perfect, which was about the... Um, it was actually about nutrition and diet and is there a way genetically and scientifically that you can 
be permanently thin and, and lose weight and what have you. And um, Anne's idea was to do that in the style of a, an audio diary with me as a woman who wanted to lose a bit of weight. I don't think she needed to look very far for the inspiration, but I went along with it. And it, and it was just, again, it was before all the mock documentaries, but that was effectively what it was in the 90s, a sort of mock documentary style. And I think there was a period over the, you know, in the 2000s and that decade where all those styles of programmes went out of fashion because it was all about live news, not just in TV, because I joined News 24, but also within radio. Everything had to be live, live, live. And I think a lot of the creativity and the skills of radio disappeared. And ironically, as often everything comes full circle, I think they're coming back. And so I'm really pleased, for example, I much, even though I guess presented Material World on several, for several years, I actually really, really prefer inside science to Material World, because I think it suits science better, because not every scientist is a fantastic speaker. Um, I've had scientists who've come in to do live Material World, and the first thing they've said to me is, I don't want to speak. <laughs> and he was frozen with fear, and it was two minutes before we were about to talk. And every time I looked across the table from him to speak, he just went, <laughs> oh, Yeah, exactly. It's a tough ask. You know, you're asking for broadcasting skills. It's very tough. And I think, you know, the fact that Inside Science has a more magazine format, and you can go to the lab, you can go with them on location, because science is a process too. You not only get more of it from a radio point of view, from a creative point of view, you get more from a content point of view. Because if you're only down the line with headphones on, you do not see where they work, you do not see how they work, you do not see the equipment. So it affects your script. Instead of your script just being, here's Professor so-and-so from so-and-so, you can say more about that you know, in a room that looks like you know, straight out of The Hobbit. You can add things to it that really inform you more about the science and make it better radio. And I'm just going to end on uh, one final clip, which I really love. It's only about, it's about 40 seconds long, but it's great. This is actually from a, a, another um, podcast. And this is the way I think radio you know, and audio can give you the process of science too, because not all scientists work in a lab or in front of a computer screen. Loads of them are out and about. And um, in a way, that's what I, I probably enjoy most of all, is the location reporting and presenting, because it's just fantastic. In this case, it's a scientist who's doing the presenting. We just gave him a sort of, you know, a, a speedy way of course of sort of, okay, this is what we want. You're going to be recording material. This is how you do it. Um, as I said, you know, sound quality is crucially important. If it's not right, it's dead. Um, this is what we want. This is how you record it. This is, these are the sort of things we're looking for. And this is just one. He was absolutely superb. His name's Tim Cockrell. And uh, this is just a fraction, just to say 20 seconds of what he recorded or so in the uh, Borneo jungle. I'm standing below a uh, Borneo gibbon. It's about 40 meters above me. This is one of the wake-up calls of the rainforest. It's dangling by one arm from the canopy. And this one's a female. You can tell by the, the call it's making. And it's presenting its call across the forest. It's establishing its territory. They do this every morning. I mean, you know, when you're listening to that, it's even better if you hear it, you know, on loudspeakers and properly, you know, in a way. It's just amazing. And in fact, that's... He's not studying gibbons. <laughs> he's actually uh, studies insects in um, rainforests in northern Borneo. So although that was actually, technically speaking, nothing to do, and, and we hear loads about all his insects and how he gets leeches on his buttocks, he is just brilliant. <clears throat> it really gets you into understanding how science is done, not just the, here are the results, this is what I did, this is, this is how it worked. <clears throat> and that's where I think radio kicks ass. With, with other media. It uh, goes to parts that other media cannot reach. I would like to hear that was so interesting. Um, it's very difficult to condense years and years and years of experience learning lessons, tiny lessons that you learn um, into five, ten minutes and try to communicate the, kind, the efforts it goes into making a video or a radio, but that was really beautiful. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, so... Finally, we have Mohit. Um, Mohit Bakaya, like I said, is a Radio 4 commissioner. So, 
Mohit, what we want to know is what is going on in your head when you're commissioning Radio 4? Oh, well, I wouldn't <laughs> go there. Um, so I haven't got a presentation, which I was feeling very embarrassed about and thinking, oh, God, classic radio person. Uh, <laughs> couldn't come up with any visuals. But having seen Brady uh, kind of uh, experience, I'm rather smug now um, <laughs> because it would have just gone wrong. Um, but, uh, that, I mean, I thought Brady's was really interesting and inspiring. And just looking at the views you're getting on some of those videos, it's really, really impressive. Uh, and Sue has done a rather brilliant job at uh, saying how wonderful and important sound is to, uh, uh, to explaining and, and, and fascination with science. So I don't have to do that, I hope. Um, I should put one little uh, caveat in. I'm not a scientist. Um, Sue's very sweet to remember my brief time in the science <laughs> unit. But I'm another one of those uh, dastardly uh, humanities graduates. So if there's anything I say you don't agree with, you can just dismiss it by saying, actually, he's an arts graduate. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, um, first question, before I start talking, I'm going to talk a little bit about the programmes. I commission, um, I should just say, I commission, as well as science, I commission current affairs, politics and religion on Radio 4. So I have quite a big uh, brief. Science is only one part of it, but it's a very, very important part. And in some ways, uh, the bit I'm proudest of in terms of, I've been at Radio 4 for about five years as a commissioning editor. Um, longer as a producer and editor uh, uh, on various programmes. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's the one area I feel proudest of the, of the journey we've been on in the last few years in terms of introducing new programmes and changing programmes and commissions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what matters to me in terms of uh, programming, uh, but also uh, a little bit about uh, um, the programmes which are there as regular programmes on Radio 4 and what I think makes them work. Um, but I'm going to ask a quick question first, which is how many of you are regular Radio 4 listeners and Radio 4 science listeners particularly? Oh, oh well, that's gratifying. <laughs> um, good. Okay. Well, hopefully some of this will make sense to you. Um, so some programmes that I've uh, introduced recently, and I just want to talk about why, because, again, you know, science, as I know, is a very... People are very get very um, passionate about science and science coverage on Radio 4, as I discover uh, practically every day. And, uh, and so... Not one, one isn't always able to explain the reasons why one does things, and, and people have their favourites, and they get very upset when you cancel programmes like Material World and, you know, and introduce other programmes which they feel are not quite what Radio 4 should be doing around science. And so, anyway, the first one is Monkey Cage, Infinite Monkey Cage, we introduced a few years ago, and that was because we felt, I felt very strongly that we were not reaching out to a younger audience that was very interested in science. We, you know, I mean, to be called them the nerds would be unfair, but I'm going to. Uh, so the nerds, um, the people out there who were really interested in science, maybe hadn't discovered Radio 4, were consuming, if they were consuming any Radio 4 at all, they were consuming our comedy. Um, but they were really smart and they were really interested and we weren't giving them anything. And so when uh, Sasha Fleecham, a rather brilliant producer in the science unit, came to me, and said, well, why don't we do something with Brian Cox, who at that point was not quite the colossus he is now. <laughs> um, I got excited, and then we found Robin to go with him, and we worked really hard at getting it right. And the one thing I always said to them was, the most important thing here is you get the science right. The comedy, if you go through a programme where it doesn't have any laughs, it's not a disaster. If you go through a programme which doesn't have really serious, groundbreaking science, it is a disaster. And if you get that equation wrong, you'll have lost it. And I think it's very important in everything we do, particularly when we mix genres, is that we have to be true to the science, and we try to do that. Um, another programme I'm very proud of uh, is a programme not made by our science unit, but made by a team in Scotland called The Digital Human. And if you haven't caught it, I really... I, if all the programmes I've commissioned, it's the one I'm proudest of, I think, because... Um, it started, again, with me thinking, uh, with Alex Krotowski, we need a programme that properly explains how the digital world is affecting us. And not the same old uh, exploration of the internet and avatars and second life and all the rather pr and social media, all the rather predictable ways that the internet gets talked about. Is it good? Is it bad? This kind of rather, kind of, I thought, simplistic debate that was taking place around digital culture. But actually, the subtle ways in which it changes behaviour and it changes the way... We well, whether it's the way we take a photograph or the stuff we have in our living room, because actually now we can make digitise so much of it, and what then we choose to present to people and what we choose to hide. Just our attitudes. They did a brilliant programme about altruism, how digital culture was changing the altruistic act, because, of course, you can now be altruistic and no one will know who you are. Whereas, you know, so that's, that's the anonymity of the digital culture offers you is kind of interesting. And Alex Krotowski and the team of Scotland make it, but they make it, Sue was talking about sound, they make it with a beautiful soundtrack, and it's a very lush, radio-rich, radiophonic uh, programme. And I just think it's wonderful. And they've got a lovely Tumblr page, uh, and, it's, and, and, yeah, and if you're interested in digital culture and you're interested in technology, but you're also interested in philosophy and, and society and how society is changing, I recommend it. 
Um, the Life Scientific is another program we've introduced, and that's one where uh, Richard Holmes wrote in his book, The Age of Wonder, um, he was surprised that we didn't, tr the scientist who, who kind of was an 18th century hero, we romanticized the scientists in the 18th century, now we don't. And he said, why is it that we don't talk about scientists in the way we talk about poets or writers? Why are we not interested in their biography, in their hinterland, in who they are? We just talk often, certainly true already of four, we often talk about them purely as, uh, as, as, as people who do experiments, people who have got new things to tell us. We don't get very interested, we didn't used to get very interested in them as people. And actually, scientists are really interesting people too. And so I, Gwyn and I, when Gwyn Williams came in, she um, introduced uh, Life Scientific, and it was just an attempt to say, let's find out who these scientists are, and let's find out where their inspiration comes from and what they also do besides going kind to of hang out in the lab. Uh, and the great anxiety from everyone, including me, was that we were going to run out of scientists after about Program 12, um, and then we were going to be uh, really struggling around. And the extraordinary thing is it's been going, what, three years, four years, three years, four years now? And we just haven't run out. There are just more and more fascinating scientists out there with brilliant stories, great hinterlands, really interesting uh, uh, conversations with Jim. Uh, and again, if you haven't caught it, it's at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday. I think it's a thing of joy. Um, I, won't, I want to talk a little bit, just briefly, about um, the programmes I commission. I'm in, the commission, I'm in a commissioning round at the moment, and what I do is I get a lot of ideas that come in, thousands of them, um, and we sit down and we work through and try and decide which ones to put on Radio 4. And it's quite hard because we don't have many, many slots and we have uh, lots and lots of brilliant ideas from people like Sue and, and many others, uh, both in and outside the BBC. Uh, and I've got an elaborate science joke here, which is not going to work, so here goes. Um, my formula, um, I, have si I have six um, indicators, six things that guide me, beginning with the letter E. Um, hold that thought. Um, <laughs> When we commission, we have our own little elaborate scheme, which is for anything we commission, we call it level two. If it's uh, shortlisted, we call it a level four. If it's rejected, we call it a level seven. Uh, and if we want to pass it to someone else, because we don't really want to do it, but we think someone ought to, we call it a level six. Um, so level twos are what you want, because level twos are, are, are commissions. So I've got my E equals MC squared, which is E, which are my uh, things which will get you commissioned, Mohit's commissions, level two. Do you see? <laughs> it was terrible, wasn't it? Anyway, okay, so here are my E's. I've got six oh, E's. Got yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I needed the presentation. I'm not feeling so bad about my PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, it's all even now, right? <laughs> um, so my six E's are emerging, engaging, explaining, emotional, enchanting, and exploding. And I want to just explain very briefly what I mean by those, because these are the, these, this is the DNA of a great science programme, if you like. These are the things which, if you can hit one or more of these things, I get excited. Um, emerging. Now, emerging is probably the most important for me, and science actually does much better than most in this score, because my biggest problem, and our biggest problem, really, for, I think, is that we are incredibly uh, uh, slavish to the print media. So if it's been appeared in a, a, in a magazine or a newspaper... Uh, we think it's a story. We're very bad at breaking stories and setting the agenda on Radio 4, I think, and I'm trying to encourage us, and that's true in current affairs and, and, science, um, and in history and, and, and in uh, uh, religion as much as it is in anywhere else. Science actually is a bit better because science often we go to the journals, but even then we rely a lot on someone publishing something before we start to explore it. And one of the things I'm really excited about is when people say, actually, there's something interesting going on here. We don't quite know what the science is or what the research is, but I think this is worth digging into. Um, and one of the things I did a few years ago is I had a brain season, not because, and we did a load of stuff on neuroscience. Not, and, of course, lots have been published on neuroscience, but what I wanted to encourage people to do was say, take a thought experiment and run it through the classrooms, run it through the law courts, run it through politics, see where the neuro neuroscience is taking us when we start to think about how our society might change, how science might change society. And that's one of the things that is a constant theme for me, which is how can we, taking science out of the lab, into the streets, rather... Kind of sounds like a rather tedious commissioning editor's thing to say, I know, but it is really important, I think, for the audience who are a lay audience listening to our science programmes most of the time, as well as people obviously know about science. Uh, and they, and what's, what we can do is help them understand how science is changing their world, because science is changing their world rapidly and will do even more rapidly in the future, and we need to help them ex understand that. So I'm always looking for emerging stories, things which are, aren't yet in the public consciousness that we can publish first. That's, that's my big phrase, publish first on Radio 4. 
engaging. Well, this is part of the same thing, but it's very much, um, so I think for some examples, a couple of programs we're about to commission, one called Death of Sleep, um, and another one which is about to come out quite about the history of self-help. And there's another program that Tamandra Hartness, who I saw earlier, I don't know if she's in the room, but she was certainly here, uh, presented about personality politics. And all of them are programs about how science is engaging with society. So the death of sleep, terribly important subject. I got a single uh, offer on this. I'm going to make it much, much bigger because I think actually the more we discover about the science of sleep, the more we discover how important sleep is and how much it's impacting on other bits of our society and how the society functions and how you know, a, a, a consumer culture you know, militates against the kind of things we need. Now, that could be a straightforward political current affairs program, but the science is really interesting, and it's a way of getting science, again, to engage with how people live their lives. Self-help, again, if you go to Waterstones, you see the creaking shelves of self-help books now. And, and what uh, a, a young producer in um, science is going to do is he's going to make a, just do a history of self-help. I actually wanted Will Self to present it. Um, but he said, he, although he appreciated the nominative determinism, he wasn't going to do it. Um, but, um, uh, and it's just, again, trying to get people to understand where this idea comes from, you know, going back to Samuel Smiles, going back and looking at the history of an idea which, you know, we all know, particularly as we face uh, difficult times, we, we reach for those self-help books. So again, it's just trying, and it's not straight science, but I think there is a science <coughs> idea there, if you take a broader idea of science. So engaging, so I say finding science and where people's anxieties are and then finding out where the science is to help them with those or help understanding it. The third one is an obvious one, explaining, and that's about big, quite serious authoritative series. So Lisa Jardine last year did the Seven Ages of Science, a brilliant tour de force trot through the last three, four hundred years and looking at how science and how science evolved mirrored the way society was evolving in history and kind of, again, making a case for uh, uh, the science, science history is, is a thing in itself. A very recent series that Adam Rutherford presented, Intelligence Born Smart, Born Equal and Born Different, a really brilliant, I thought, but rather uh, terrifying trot through the whole <coughs> argument around genetics and science and eugenics and all the kind of very, very uh, sensitive territory there is there. And I thought they did it very well and got to some very interesting arguments about uh, this, but at a time when Douglas Cummings, uh, Gove's ex-education um, advisor, is starting to talk about natural intelligence, and we're starting to think, actually, how much money should we be plowing into education if actually it's all about uh, genetic and difference rather than what you can do in the classroom? How science plays into that debate is incredibly important, and understanding the science, and learning, understanding the history, and understanding why eugenics, uh, and, and particularly post the Second World War, becomes a very set back a lot of the science because people were very nervous about what they could and couldn't say. Understanding all that is absolutely crucial to being able to take part in the debate now. Sorry, I know I'm going on a bit long. I will really rush through the next few. Uh, emotional, well, that's obvious, but it's not always just stories which have human interest angles. It's, you know, it's also about um, people getting involved. So, you know, we did a program about chemistry, and what it started with was Kat Arnie talking about her remembering her chemistry set when she was eight. And it's just, again, just trying to find ways that you can turn what often be dry subjects into uh, human focus subjects. Enchanting, uh, well, that's just because science, of course, has the best stories in the world. Uh, and, I mean, an example of what we're doing at the moment, which I think is going to be enchanting, I sent Will Self, he went last week, to CERN, and he's walking around it, and he's writing a poem. And that's his, what he's going to do. He's going to write a poem in response to CERN. Uh, and, and his contention is that you don't really understand the physics, but maybe, uh, be, well, he doesn't understand the physics, but maybe through experiencing uh, uh, the, the LHC and walking around there and meeting all the people, including the janitors as well as the scientists, he can write something beautiful. Now, that might just be a most beautiful, enchanting bit of prose poetry. I have no idea if you're understanding science at the end of it, but again, it just brings science into the, into the kind of artistic realm. Uh, and finally, uh, exploding, and that's just to try and challenge myths. So two things we've got at the moment, forensic science. Everyone out there is watching CSI and all the rest of it and thinks they're in forensic science. I know I'm walking, talking really fast now, aren't I? Uh, forensic science is, uh, you know, is, is the way all crime detection is done. Actually, forensic science is in real crisis. And so a programme which actually takes the audience and says, actually, you think this, but actually... Uh, it's not necessarily true. Uh, Alec Jar, um, recently appointed at ITV, is going to do a series for us called Saving Scientists from Scientists, where he's basically going to say the science is in real crisis at the moment. The, the number of papers, the fraud papers, are at uh, all-time high. There's all kinds of uh, 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 arguments going on within the scientific community about true impartiality and, and so on. And actually, rather than often as science is presented to the public, which is it's this in, you know, hermetically sealed, absolutely perfectly kind of solid you know, um, environment. It, he wants to kind of dig into that and, uh, and question it. So 
That's a really fast and rather too long, I apologise, kind of run through some of the things that I think about when I'm trying to commission uh, programmes I'm ready for. And as I say, uh, if you listen or if you haven't, don't listen, please do listen and then you can judge whether we're getting it right or not. Yeah, great, thank you. Mohit, you're going to get loads of commissions now. Everybody's <laughs> going to be sending them <laughs> their ideas. Um, Brady, do you want to sit here? We're going to take... Not when I'm next to radio people who've got a knife. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's pointed in my direction. <coughs> you're OK. Um, so we've got a tiny bit of time for questions. Um, <coughs> so it's over to you. Are there any questions? Yep. OK. Oh, just over there with the first hand up. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Aaron Free work for BBRC and make videos and things. Question for Brady. Um, you, you had a stellar sort of list of videos you made, all great. But could you mention some of the, the ingredients and some of the recipes? What are the, some, of, some of the principles that you put into your films to make them effective, to avoid it just being boring scientists standing there talking? You know, how do you get around that? Mm, my, my golden rule when I'm making any video is when I'm interviewing someone or whatever I'm trying to find out about, is I want to find out something that I think my wife will find interesting. My wife doesn't like science very much. She doesn't like my videos that much. She's not that interested. She's lovely, but she's just not that interested in what I find really interesting, which I think is the secret to a happy marriage. But when I'm interviewing someone, as soon as they have said something or done something or something has happened that I cannot wait to tell her that night or tell her about that night, I think... I've got a good video. So someone could be going on for ages and suddenly they'll say something like, oh, I can't wait. When, I, when, when she asked me tonight, what did you do today? Who did you meet? And I say, I met this woman or this man. And do you know what they told me? That's when I know I've got a good video. And everything else, you know, there are, lo there are many, many other things and it's not that simple, of course. But that's the golden, the golden thing. The moment you've got something you can't wait to tell your mate at the pub or your wife that night or someone who does not that interested in science... You still, it still doesn't mean you don't have loads of dense science content in there, and it doesn't mean she doesn't still find the video boring, or even the thing I tell her at dinner boring, but at least excited me enough to want to tell her, and I think that's always a good little indicator. And I would imagine on YouTube you have to grab the viewer particularly quickly because they're so quick to switch off. No, no. Really? It's the opposite. Like, they're more patient. And the, the re I loved working at the BBC... But and and I also really love radio. But I was really frustrated hearing some of the things being said about radio, saying that TV and video can't do it. You can do it. You can leave the camera rolling and get that moment. The snake bites. You can show the humanity of scientists. You can make a fifteen. You can make an hour long video on YouTube, or you can make an eight second long video on YouTube. The thing I had to do was leave the BBC. <laughs> the thing I had to do was not have 19 people tell me how things should be done, how long they should be, when they should be done, what time they should be showed, how I should make it. Or I, I was thinking, I'm, I'm right, you're wrong. All I had to do was leave. And, and then I realised I was right. <clears throat> and people do watch... How do you know that people are watching all the way through to the end? Oh, you get, you get a lot of statistics from YouTube showing you exactly at what point people lose interest in your videos. Yeah. Alarmingly so. That's a, that's a good way of getting feedback. Oh, it's, you see a graph and you're going, oh my goodness, what happened at that point that made everyone stop watching? And, and people have still got short attention spans and yes, I'll still put a, a snazzy start on to get people's attention. But it is an absolute, some of the longest, most popular videos being watched on YouTube are easily nine, ten minutes long uh, when you're talking about comparable with news reports. And I've made videos that are 20, 30 minutes long. People love them. I've also made videos that are like 10 seconds long. There's no rules. I love that. To be fair, in TV news, um, you don't have a very long time to put your stuff together. Mm. I mean, if you're out there in, in a day, you have to get it all really quickly, get it back, mm. edit it really quickly. Um, so I, make my, I make my videos in... No, I make my videos in a day. With the, when the Nobel Prize is announced, yeah. I, I have make sure the video is up within two hours. Oh, wow. But you are right. You are <laughs> right. If, you, if you've got a scientist out in the in the jungle when you went to your TV news producer and said, can I have a crew for three weeks to go out to the jungle? They would say no, whereas I could just decide to do it. So yeah. it removes all time constraints. Lovely. OK, over here. Can I raise the question of money and revenue? <laughs> how, how, how does it balance out between the crude sort of YouTube volume-driven digital <laughs> revenues and a sponsorship, I guess, from institutions, universities, whatever? How does that mix work out? Well, 
works out well. Uh, when, I, when I looked at the list of all the sessions, I said to Angela, you've got me on the wrong panel. If I was on that panel, I'd be getting asked a million questions about money. But I get asked it here as well. Uh, what's the question? How does the mix work? Yeah, I mean, is it mostly from digital advertising, or do you get most of it from the institutions? He, he wants to know where your money comes yeah. from. That's yeah, well, he, know, he knows. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mix. It's a mix of institutions, uh, the t advertising, uh, various forms of advertising. Uh, there are other ways people on YouTube can make money through merchandise. When you have a million people that think you're, that really enjoy what you're doing on YouTube, suddenly they wouldn't mind wearing a T-shirt with the name of that YouTube channel on it. Uh, there are, in, in the number file videos, we have these bits of, for various reasons I won't bore you with, in the number file videos, all the mathematicians write their equations and things on these big bits of brown paper. And I used to throw them out. And one day I put one on eBay. I said, does anyone want this? And I put it on eBay and it sold for 500 pounds. And suddenly I realised all these bits of paper that these mathematicians have been scrolling on and people have been watching these videos loads and loads of times. They don't all sell for £500, by the way, or I'd be making a lot more videos. Um, but uh, there's also the fan base. A lot of creators, I haven't started doing this yet, but a lot of the other creators have started using websites which have been created where the fans can just give them money. And, and there are people who are making thousands, if not tens of thousands of pounds a month just from the people watching, donating them money one dollar or two dollars or three dollars just because they love what you're doing. People, people want to support you. All sorts of people want to support you. Can I ask, how many YouTube viewers do you have to have before you're making a sustainable amount of money? That's like a million dollar question uh, and it depends on, it depends on your revenue model. It would depends how dependent you are purely on revenue that comes from viewers on how much you have other other methods. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to answer. If you were just dependent, just on advertising, just on those little ads that come up on YouTube videos, you and you wanted to live in London, uh, you would need, you need to get a million viewers maybe watching a video if you don't make very many videos. I don't know. It's, it's very nebulous. It's a very difficult question to answer. A million answer. is the target. A million, a million <laughs> is good. A million is good, but not necessary. OK, great. Here. Okay, uh, question for the radio people. Um, I know inside uh, science is in accepting pa packages from like freelancers. Is this kind of a new direction that the BBC is heading in? Um, are, you, are, kind of, are more programmes going to be accepting packages, feature packages from uh, freelancers? Um, I don't think there's an uh, overall strategy as often there isn't <laughs> in the BBC. Um, uh, I think probably as costs get tighter, there may well be um, opportunity. I mean, you, this is a question really for the editor of Science Radio, but um, I think as costs get tighter, there's probably going to be more scope for taking material where, as and when people can get it. And I, th I, mean, I think the golden rule is uh, if the story is good enough um, and you've got particular access or a particular angle that they can't get to. Um, that I mean, if, if I was to give advice to freelancers about how to get stuff in, don't pitch stuff they're going to know about anyway, because they've got a team doing that. What 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 gets what forces them to kind of scratch their heads and go, how can we pay for this freelance package? Is when someone comes up with a bit of dynamite that they just would never have got to. A number of times people say, oh look, do you know the you know, the LHC is starting a bit more. Yes, they do. You know, they don't need uh, another package on that. So, um, but in terms of level, I don't know if there's a c uh, coherent strategy, but um, costs are getting tight at BBC right now, as they always have been over the last f a few years. So it's possible. Could you explain, like, um, quite a bit about what is a freelance package? And what do you mean by that? So the BBC, so all, all the, <coughs> the BBC, uh, well, I mean, in some ways, maybe, Sue, you're in a better place. Uh, 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 why don't yeah, you answer uh, that, yeah. actually? Well, I mean, I yeah. do freelance. Yeah. features for Inside Science and Woman's Hour. Um, basically, it's when uh, it's somebody who doesn't work for the BBC, you're a freelance, and you make that report for them. So you record it, you write the links, you record the on-site links, you record the effects, you get everything, you, you pitch the story, you sell the story, and that's exactly right, that's how I've always lived, is, you know, doing mm -hmm. when I do freelance stuff, is you don't offer them the bleeding obvious. And, and it helps if you're somewhere where no one else is. Yeah. And often it's if I'm doing another job, actually, I will then sometimes ring up and say, oh, 
I'm actually here. And they, and they go, really? Really? And if there's no one else there, you know, that's your big trump card that, that you've got. And then you, I then edit the pieces. And sometimes, it depends on the producer, you, I will supply them with a fully mixed package that's been using professional audio software. Some cases I will supply them with my sort of MP3, so lower format um, quality-wise mix, as in this is how I hear it, you know, and um, and also so that they get an idea of, <coughs> of what it's like, and then they, I, I will then supply them each Can individual just, band with a script saying fade at this point, fade at ten seconds, go under that, so that they can then mix it properly, <laughs> you know, or yeah. they can mix it to however they want to and then move it. So it's um, but if you it's have a great less experience, they'll do a bit more for you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You would just supply your yeah. edited bands, but you have to be able to edit. You have to have basic digital stuff, ra yeah. radio skills mm. of editing your your material and an editorial. Mm. So you can't just give a producer. A 60 minutes worth of recordings and expect them to come up with something you have to do mm. that stuff first can i just add one more thing about because because I mean, the truth is the bbc is full of in-house producers make this stuff so the opportunities i think which is what's lies behind your question opportunities for freelancers is is limited i mean it's better in some areas than it is in others i mean news are much better at using freelancers i think than, than some of the uh, factual production areas that may change, but the other thing, just remember, is obviously we take a lot of science commissions from companies, suppliers, independent companies. A lot of the freelancers, as it were, either people outside, get, get their stuff, on, uh, get their science onto Radio 4 by pitching through some of the big uh, production companies. And you know, and, and you know, there are uh, uh, independent suppliers out there who will often it welcome freelancers well, that's exactly what we into, did, into their midst. So that's another yeah. route to go if you want yeah. to kind of get if you've got an idea for a brilliant documentary. You know, ring ring up Radio Four, or ring up Sue, or ring up me, and find out who the key suppliers are. I mean, Boffin obviously are one. There are others as well, yeah. uh, and put your idea through them. Well, we actually did it through the ABSW. We sent out, uh, yeah. you know, if for those who are on the thing, saying, look, if you're if you've got an idea and you're interested, get in touch. <coughs> and it was really good because we got a lot of ideas. I think what I think for some people was a real learning curve for them was to realise that um, how that process starts there and ends here. Because some people, for example, didn't realise that well, actually, that was done on Radio Four six months ago. Yeah. You know, they they hadn't done a basic sort of Google search of what's mm -hmm. been done. So from what I would call sort of almost rookie errors to maybe not thinking the story through properly, or like or your e your e numbers. You know, <laughs> it does it does it hit, tick all the boxes? Has that style and format and treatment been done before? Are you coming at it from a new angle? So you, you say you start with a, a lot of ideas, and, and it takes also, it takes a lot of work. You don't get paid for this development work. It's not like you work at the BBC and at least you're going in or you're a you know, full-time employee. You will still get paid no matter what you're doing, even if you're playing Tetris. You know, it, that <coughs> takes time to do a really good proposal. And even sometimes when you do do a really good proposal, the commissioners will have three equally good proposals, perhaps all on the same subject. So, you know, you have to actually have quite <coughs> a thick hide about it, but also have loads of ideas. You can't just come in with one great idea and then that's <coughs> it, you're spent. You have to be, you know, thinking, well, yes, that, that, seeing things. I'm making notes, you know, I'm always sort of writing down, oh, that was interesting, oh, I remember that. And like Brady was saying, that thing where you, you, you want to talk <coughs> about them, then you know you've got a good idea. Um, because that, as if you're a freelancer, that is your... That you're living, it's it's those identifying those opportunities and those ideas, and if it excites you, then the chances are it will probably excite other people. But there is a, a quite a, a rigorous, I would say, uh, process. Um, so we've eaten into the coffee break quite a bit now. I know there's lots more questions. Um, these guys, I guess, won't mind hanging around for a little while, so you can come over and have a chat with them. <coughs> um, my cards are here, so feel free to take them if you want my contact. And thank you. Can we have a round of applause for this excellent panel?